This is our Advent season. And if you're not familiar with the concept of Advent, Advent is where we take a look at the time when God sent his son into the world the first time. And it reminds us that he's also sending his son again. Our lives, our history will be bracketed by the first and the second coming of Jesus. And as is the tradition in the church, for many, many, many years, we have a number of different traditions in Advent. And one of the traditions we've adopted is the Advent candle. And so uh, Pastor David Stanislaus is going to come and he's going to light that first candle of the Advent season. There are five candles. There will be one being lit every weekend until and including Christmas Eve. And so we're planning for that. And the lighting of the candles, the candles themselves don't have any special significance except to say that our lighter doesn't work. And, uh, uh, but they're a reminder, if we can take us back into history, when week after week leading up to the Christmas season, an additional candle would be lit every time. It's a way of reminding us, you and I live in rushed, hectic days. And as we live in these rushed, hectic days, sometimes it's good for us to be reminded of the continuing pace of life and that life continues on. Now, Advent also talks about, uh, has been, is something that the church has celebrated for many, many years. And one of the ways that we celebrate this season and Christmas season is through songs. And many people sing all kinds of Christmas songs, and we hear Christmas music everywhere. And you have that ongoing debate of when's the right time to start singing Christmas songs. I grew up in the Philippines. Christmas starts during the Burr months, September, October, December, November, December. But what I've always found out is that the messages of many of the Christmas songs are very powerful messages. In the history of the church, the church used songs to teach lessons or to reinforce lessons. And people not only had a Bible, but they had a hymn book. And in learning the songs and learning the hymns, uh, they, they learned valuable lessons. Now, what I discovered over the years was a lot of times people didn't really understand what they were singing. They sang songs, they sang words, and they didn't really know what the words meant. In fact, sometimes people didn't even know what the words were. And as they sang them, they just sort of went along with the sounds. Well, what we want to do is we want to take time over this season for our Advent series. We're going to be remembering songs of Christmas, special songs of Christmas, but we're going to remember the lesson that that song teaches. Now, the one that we're going to work with today is one of my favorite of all the Christmas hymns. It was written by a guy named John Neal in 1851, and John is also the guy who wrote Good King Wenceslaus. But it's based much, much earlier. As far as the 8th century, there was a series of seven statements or seven poems or seven thematic statements that were repeated in the churches in Latin in the seven last days leading up to Christmas. These were seven statements about Jesus Christ, and they all come from the book of Isaiah and the prophecies of Isaiah. And this continued on for many years, as early as the 12th century. We understand that they began to try and put music to these different seven stanzas. But in 1851, this gentleman, John Neal, took a, a portion of these, and he combined them with the statements that were made from the book of Isaiah with a tune that came also from a religious background. It was a 15th century tune from France. It was a processional song as nuns would come into the place of worship and he combined them together in this song that we call O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, one of my favorite of the hymns. Now, as we get ready to read, as we get ready to hear about it and sing about it, let me give you some insights into what you need to understand as we do it. First of all, of course, because it's all taken from the book of Isaiah, there's an extensive use of Old Testament imagery to talk about worshiping God for all the things that God has done and for the things that he did through Christ, who he sent into the world. And these songs also ask that the same Jesus Christ who came 2,000 years ago would continue the same works in our life. One of the things that we need to remind ourselves is as we go through here, and it talks about Israel, the Old Testament people of God, Israel, then we need to understand that you and I are the New Testament people of God. And as we go through our lives and as we go through the world around us, we want God to do in us and for us what he also did for his people in the Old Testament days, especially by sending his son. So we're going to go through, we're going to learn four stanzas of the song. We're going to learn four titles that are given to Jesus in the book of Isaiah. And then to close our service together, we're going to sing the song together. And as we sing it, 
you'll be remembering all of these wonderful lessons and hopefully you'll remember them in the days to come. But let's pray before we start with this. Father, we rejoice in this wonderful song because this song reminds us of what you have done for us. You have sent your Son into the world. And Father, I pray that we would be alert in these moments, that we would listen, that we would understand, and we would see that you are a God who never changes, that you've always dealt faithfully and lovingly and graciously, but with justice towards your people, that you've called your people to you and that you have provided salvation to your people through Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and that you're sending your Messiah, your son Jesus, to come back for us at some point in the future. We want to live our lives in the way that you have called your people to always live so that we might live lives that are pleasing to you. Father, I pray that each person by your Holy Spirit would be alert this morning. We would be thinking and that you would speak to our hearts in a very special way. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's start off with the first name that we're going to look at. And that is the name Emmanuel. The first stanza that we sing says, O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appear. What is this verse talking about? Well, of course, if you know the history of the people of Israel, the people of God, exile was a state that they, they found themselves in at least twice in their history, extensively in Egypt and then later on in Babylon. And they were always put into that position where when they wandered away from what God had wanted them to do, he needed to uh, allow someone to come and, and put them into exile so that they would be longing for God again and that they would turn to him. And so what is this talking about? These people who are captive, these people who are, are in exile, what does Emmanuel mean to them? Well, in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, we hear this promise. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and you will call him Emmanuel. Well, what does Emmanuel mean? It's a phrase that means God with us. In Isaiah, this promise was given to all of God's people that someday God would take matters into his own hands. That someday God himself would inject himself into the, 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 the pages of history and he would send himself. And we know and you and I understand that that happened when Jesus Christ came into the world. That is a description of who he is. He is Emmanuel, God with us. From an Advent perspective, we also see that you and I have that same promise. That God is with us. What lesson do we want to take? Jesus, the word made flesh, God sent to live amongst us. The lesson that we want to take is that God cares, that God loves us, that he cares for us, and that he has come to be with us. Now, as we read through the Christmas story and as we read through the Gospels this past year as a church, we've, the last couple of years, we've read through, uh, we've read through uh, Luke and we've read through Mark and we're read, reading now in the book of John, and we've seen this wonderful way that Jesus came into the world and we've seen all the things that we can learn from the fact that Jesus came into the world. And the powerful lesson that we receive is that God cares enough about us to send his son into the world to come and die for you and to come and die for me. God cares enough to send his son and his son cares enough to give himself as a sacrifice to us. If you've been reading John, you remember back in John chapter 3, verse 17, where Jesus said these wonderful words, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. We need to remember that God's purpose in sending his Son was not to, not to criticize, not to judge, not to put down people. But his son came into the world so that people could know him and people could have a relationship with him and people could follow him and people could be saved. And we see it over and over and over again in the life of Jesus. In these last days, we have been considering these wonderful truths as we have read through these words in the gospel. And a few days ago, we read the, the words of Jesus where Jesus made this wonderful statement. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one can come to the Father except by me. And as we were talking about that, somebody said, well, that reminds me of, uh, of exclusivity because Jesus is the exclusive way. And I said, you know, that's a little bit dangerous for to express us that way because we, we, missed the, we missed the whole lesson there. You see, Jesus did not say 
that there's one set of activities that is morally superior to another set of activities. And if you do this instead of this, if you do this instead of this, then somehow you are appropriate and you can find yourself closer to God. Jesus said, not a set of activities, not a set of religious practices, not adopting a certain religious name, not going to a certain time or a certain place or anything else like that. Jesus said, I am the way. And what he meant was that he was not giving one set of rules instead of another set of rules. What he was saying is the only way to the Father is through relationship with me. And he speaks to the people who are his followers and he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's what Emmanuel means. That we can never reach God through our own righteous practices no matter how hard we try. But instead God reaches for us. He sent his Son into the world And we can rejoice because we can know the Father through knowing the Son. And that's the stanza that we will sing over and over and over again. Rejoice, rejoice. Emmanuel shall come for us, God's people, just as he came 2,000 years ago for his people. Rejoice that Jesus, in fact, did come and still comes into our lives every day. Second figure of speech or second figure that we're going to look at is a little bit more complicated. It's the stump of Jesse. The stump of Jesse. Who was Jesse? And it's not a trick question. Who was Jesse? It's not the guy that was on Full House. It's who was Jesse? The father of David. Who was David? King David. And he was the, the, the founder of the house of David and we were promised that the Messiah would come from the house of David in the book of Matthew and the book of Luke. You see a lot of focus taken to prove that Jesus was from that house, okay? So let's take a look at this. The song that we're going to sing and the verse we're going to sing is, goes like this. O come thou rod of Jesse free, thine own from Satan's tyranny, from depths of hell thy people save, and give them victory or the grave. What's that all about? What what, what is this rod of Jesse? Well, let's read the passage of Scripture and that it's taken from, and let's see what it says. Uh, This comes from Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 5. And it says, A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding. The Spirit of counsel and of might. The Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. From the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. What is this promise? And why Jesse? Why not say of David? Well, remember the context here, folks. They had seen the establishment of the house of David. They had seen David become God's king in Jerusalem. They had seen his sons. And they had seen the house of David degenerate into corruption, self-centeredness, selfishness, evil doing, and wickedness. And the house of David was, was not the kind of house that was really doing righteousness in God's eyes. And yet there's a promise here, and the promise here is that there's going to be something coming from the stump of Jesse. Now, I think that's why that, that, that Isaiah, when he gave this oracle, why he mentioned Jesse instead of David. And, and, and I'm not alone in this. Commentators going all the way back to John Calvin agree on this. That in fact, they recognize that, that David, his, his, the promise was going to come through him But he had been corrupted. If you look through these five things, his descendants had been corrupted. But the things that you see in these five verses are a promise that there's going to be a different kind of ruler, a ruler who is going to be right and righteous and just, who will never give an incorrect decision, who will never judge anyone unfairly. You and I know, of course, that that promise is Jesus and that Jesus is coming to judge and to rule on the earth. But there's something else going on here. What is this thing about stumps? It's a figure of speech that's been used earlier in Isaiah. Earlier in chapter 6 of Isaiah, God talks about how his people Israel, because of their disobedience, they're going to be knocked down. They're going to be, they're going to be destroyed. Have you ever seen a picture of a, of a, of a clear-cut forest? 
Have you ever seen some of those pictures that some of the environmentally conscious groups have circulated about some of the places like in, in Brazil where they've clear cut all those trees or in, in Kalimantan for that matter where they've gone and, and clear cut it and, and it just looks so terrible. It looks so desolate where once there was these mighty forests and jungles and things like that and now it's just all these stumps looking ugly and, and the ground's all eroded away and things like that. In Isaiah chapter 6, uh, the Lord speaks through Isaiah and said, this is what's going to happen to Israel. You see, Israel hadn't been the nation that they were supposed to be. They were supposed to honor God. They were supposed to follow God. And they had been disobedient. The house of David had become corrupt. And God says, you will be cut down as a house. And then later in chapter 10, he speaks of the Assyrians. Now the Assyrians were a group of the people who came against the Israelites. And, and what happened was that God gave the Assyrians to oppress them so that they would turn to God. But God tires of them. God is angry at them for their wickedness. So even though he used them, it doesn't justify their wickedness. By the way, if, if you're kind of curious about how that works, that's what we see over and over in the Old Testament. God will use wicked people but it doesn't excuse their wickedness. And that's what happens to the Assyrians. In, in chapter 10, there's a prophecy that the others are going to come against the Assyrians, the Medes, the Persians, the Babylonians, and they will destroy them like a whole forest, just clear cut down to the stumps. What's the difference? The stump that is Israel, that, that dead looking piece of wound, wood, a, a, a shoot, a plant will come up out of that stump. And when you think there is no more kingdom of David, there will be a king that comes from David's line. And he will be the right kind of king. This is a promise of Jesus Christ coming. This promise is that even though things have been beaten, even though things have been defeated, even though it seems like your enemies have triumphed over you, don't forget, God will always be able to deliver you. No matter what may have happened to you, no matter what may be happening in your life, you should remember that God will always deliver you. Just like God delivered his people. God destroyed his, the enemies of his people. But when it seemed like his people were completely chopped down, when it seemed like the kingdom of David, the house of David had been destroyed forever, out of the house of David came the Messiah. And the Messiah is a righteous and just ruler. I, I don't know what's really going on in your life. I know that, I know that there, for a lot, of a lot of people in IES, things are going pretty good. But I know that for a lot of people, they don't, they're not going so well. Maybe circumstances aren't working out very well for you, or there's differences and difficulties in your life. You know, if I can stand up here and tell you that if you follow Jesus, you'll always do well, you'll always be healthy, everything will go prosperous for you, you'll make a lot of money if you follow Jesus, I would be the, like the most popular pastor in Jakarta. But I can't do that because it's not true. It's not even, not even close to true, and it's certainly not biblical. And I, though, some of you face real difficulties. You face difficulties in your homes. You face difficulties in your marriages. You face difficulties in your business life, in your professional life. Sometimes you face so many difficulties, you feel like your life has just been cut completely. But remember, we serve a God who's in the restoration business. We serve a God who brings forth out of the things that seem like they are dead, new life. And he has sent his son into our lives so that he can deliver us from whatever circumstance we might face. And I just want to encourage you, don't be discouraged by the circumstances around you, but instead turn to the Lord and turn to his son Jesus who came for you and know that God will ultimately deliver you. Let's move on. Number three, figure of speech, day spring. Does anybody know what a day spring is? Sounds like a good marketing name for a new kind of mattress, right? oh did you see my new day spring you know something like that or maybe it could be like a, a small little sporty economical car that's run by electricity or something like that well that's not what a day spring is actually a day spring is a terminology from ancient english and it refers to the place on the horizon where the sun comes up because that's where day springs from now there's there, there's a story that they tell in, in the Pacific Islands that if you if you watch the horizon and if you know where the sun is going to come up just in that last brief glimmer of a second before the sun breaks through you'll see this flash of this emerald blue color as the light shines through the very top of the horizon of the water 
And I don't know if it's actually true or not. I, I've, I've spent time looking at it, trying to see. I, I thought one time when I was in Guam, I saw a flash like that, but, but I don't know what it really was. And I don't know how many of you guys are even awake when the sun comes up, so I don't know if that's going to apply, except for our golfers. But I don't think we have too many golfers here today because they come on Saturday night and then golf on Sunday morning. Day spring. Day spring where the sun's going to come up. What is that all about? The words of the song go like this. O come thou day spring, come and cheer our spirits by thine advent here and drive away the shades of night and pierce the clouds and bring us light. What does it mean to us? that God brings light into our life through Jesus Christ. What are the symbols that we see of light? Light reveals. Light brings encouragement. Light brings comfort. As we read through the book of John, we see over and over and over this contrast between darkness and light and how the people in the world have to choose whether they want to walk in darkness or whether they want to walk in light. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, we saw this amazing thing happen as we're reading through our devotions together, reading through our soap together. It's the story of of, of Lazarus. You remember how that story goes? In the story of Lazarus, Lazarus dies, and they put him in a tomb, and Jesus doesn't show up, and he doesn't show up, and he doesn't show up. Lazarus is like the most dead guy that ever was raised from the dead. I mean, he's not just dead. He's dead dead. You know, he's, he's been in a tomb for four days. If I can be indelicate... Everybody could smell that he was gone. Yeah? And Jesus shows up and calls him out of the tomb and he's raised from the dead. And we see, and I think it's in chapter 13, where the Pharisees and the enemies of Jesus say, all these people are going over to Jesus because of Lazarus. Let's kill Lazarus. What an amazing thing that people would love the darkness so much that having seen one of the greatest miracles of all time, they would reject the light of Jesus and they would turn towards the darkness. This is the promise that you and I have. In Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ, the light of of light and the light of life comes into our lives and our life can be changed. We can live lives of openness. We can live lives without fear. We can live lives of encouragement knowing that the steps before us are lit and provided by God. In Isaiah chapter 9, all of, these, all of these words come from Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 9, we read this. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. And on those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For most of us who are here today, we can understand that. We can understand that there was a time when our lives were in darkness and we went our own way and there was confusion and fear and sin. And yet we turned our hearts towards Jesus and he lit up our whole life. For those of you who have never experienced that, I want to just challenge you to make a decision to follow Jesus and to change everything about your life. In Luke chapter 1, verses 78 and 79, Zechariah talks about his son John the Baptist who's going to be the one that tells everybody about Jesus. And he says, because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven, to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet unto the path of peace. God sent his world, his son into the world to be a light on all those who are in darkness. God brings us into the light. If you feel like you're in the darkness of fear or confusion today, turn to him because his promise is to bring you into the light. Our final figure of speech comes from this stanza. O come thou key of David, come, and open wide our heavenly home. Make safe the way that leads on high, and close the path to misery. Key of David, what is that all about? Remember what we said? The promise was that the descendant of David would be the Messiah. We understand that that was Jesus. What is the key of David? Well, a key does more than just open and close things. It's a symbol of the authority to be able to open and close things. I remember when I was a teenager and the first time that my parents gave me a key to the apartment, it meant that I was old enough and had the ability to come and go on my own will and not just have to come and go when I was told by my parents. And that's exactly the figure of speech that we have here, that God has given his son Jesus the authority over all the things of this earth and it is in his hand and his decision to make right things that need to be made right 
in Isaiah 22, verse 22, where this comes from. It says, I will place on his shoulder the key to the house of David. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. Does your life seem random sometimes? Do you think like you, you feel sometimes like you're, you're, you're just subject to whatever happens and goes on around you? God has given authority to Jesus to open doors and to close doors. And if we put our hope and trust in him, he will lead us safely. He will open up the doors of opportunity. He will open up the doors of, of, of healing. He will open up the doors of direction in our lives. And he will protect us by closing other doors. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 7, John, when he has this amazing revelation and this amazing vision from God, he sees this same thing that is a promise before Jesus came as a promise to the time that comes in the future. It says, To the angel in the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut. What he shuts, no one can open. Jesus has given authority has been given authority by God over the affairs and history of all mankind but more importantly he's been given authority by God over your life over my life and as we surrender our way to him he has the keys to open those doors before him and he has the keys to close those doors before us if we put our hope and trust in him and obey him and walk with him and follow him if we let him be our lord and savior and messiah he will bring us to his place of eternity. The way will come when he will lead us and guide us until we have all been together with him. God, through his son Jesus, preserves all of us into eternity and our lives are safe in his hands. There's a lot of fear in many circles in this city today. A lot of people are worried about the, the impact of political things that are going on and governmental things that are going on. And, and it is right and, and it is correct that we pray and it is right and correct that we do everything that we are able to do in whatever place we are to influence things for God. But it's also important that we understand that the keys to the house of David are in the hands of our, our Lord and Savior and he opens doors and he closes doors. We have seen these four figures of speech in here. And we need to remember that, Jesus, that God being, Jesus being Emmanuel means that God cares and he is with us. We need to remember that the stump of Jesse reminds us that he will deliver us no matter what circumstance. We need to remember that the day spring is the light of Jesus coming into our lives. We need to remember that the key of David symbolizes the authority that God has given Jesus. That if we put our trust and faith in him... God will preserve us until eternity.